Hi, welcome to Teen Pride Book Talks. My name is Lucy, and this is the program on AADL TV, where each episode I take a few minutes to tell you about a young adult book that is both representative of and inclusive of folks in the LGBTQIA plus community. And the book that I am going to be talking a little bit about today is called Daniel Deconstructed, and this is by James C. Ramos. This was published in February of 2024, and it is the story of a high schooler named Daniel. He is self-described as nerdy. He loves old movies. He loves LARPing. He is a huge film buff and very deeply into photography. And the photography really plays a key role for Daniel in this book. Daniel is autistic, but he doesn't tell anybody that. His family knows, and that is pretty much it. The camera works well for him because it is something that he can carry around with him and use as a buffer between himself and social situations and other situations that he is still trying to figure out the best way to navigate in that moment. He has learned through some bad experiences how to get by by attempting to completely mask his autism. And he is pretty good at it. Daniel's father is also autistic. Daniel's mother is neurotypical. And they have different philosophies about how Daniel should behave and approach school and social situations. Daniel's father feels like experience is the best way for him to learn. And Daniel's mother is more protective and wants him not to overexert himself and to make sure he's giving himself time to rest so that he can remain somewhat in his comfort zone. Daniel's philosophy, and he says that, he says, my philosophy lies somewhere in the middle of their ideological tug of war. I can exist in an elastic society and maybe even thrive just as long as I keep doing what I'm supposed to, just as long as I keep playing my role. And luckily, I'm very good at that. So as you can imagine, this takes a lot of mental energy and time for Daniel Daniel's best friend is a girl named Mona, and they've been best friends for a long time. Mona is very high energy. She's boisterous. She's a superstar athlete. She's a soccer player. She's beautiful. She always seems to be in relationships. She's bisexual. She's dated a handful of folks at their school. Because Daniel sees that he's so opposite from Mona, he feels like maybe he's robbing Mona of something. Maybe Mona should be spending all her time with someone like him when she has all this energy to give. This social currency that he feels is a little bit higher than his. So he decides he is going to find someone for her that would be a better fit, someone to hang out with. Mona has recently ended a relationship and she seems pretty sad about that. So this sort of gives Daniel the idea to find someone else for Mona to fall in love with. And he would like to do this before the homecoming dance. What throws an extra challenge into the social situation at this high school is that it is currently in a new merger. One high school sort of disbanded and entered into this other one. So there's a bunch of new students here, even though these students have been in this high school for a bit of time. So that sort of mixes things up and changes who people are seeing and who they're encountering and how they behave around one another. Entering into the scene is a new classmate named Gabe. And the minute Daniel spots Gabe, Gabe is a musician, he sees Gabe playing at a gig and he thinks, who is that person? They sort of had this vibe, this very relaxed, energetic, but cool and very beautiful vibe. They would be perfect for Mona. And he finds out this is Gabe. He meets Gabe. Gabe is sort of mysterious, but very friendly. And Gabe is non-binary. And Daniel just feels like Gabe and Mona will be perfect together. So he decides he's going to plan this perfect meet cute. This is part of its love of film that plants this idea in his head that Mona and Gabe getting together should be exactly like it happens in the movies. So his mind starts churning and he's constructing these scenarios and he always tries to put them in the same place at the same time and sort of expects this magic to happen. Like here, I'll push these two ingredients together and something will form. And he's a little bit surprised when that's not instantly the case. It's almost as if Daniel's viewing himself as the director of this romantic situation. Matchmaking is not part of a world that Daniel's familiar with. Daniel does not want to currently be in a relationship, he doesn't think. He had that experience that he refers to a little bit. And he's learning on the job, as it were, how little he knows and how illogical it all is. This world of dating and of love and relationships and 
how it isn't like the movies and nothing plays out that way. And it's much more complicated. And involving two people means involving many more people who are involved with those people and who know those people. And all of a sudden, Daniel finds that he's not as much the director as he's actually part of this situation that he's created. And Daniel and Gabe start to become closer. Daniel really gets this feeling that he's not familiar with when he's around Gabe, but he discounts it or ignores it because he's so convinced that Gabe and Mona are going to be perfect together. So the story really is about building relationships, but also about friendships and how they work and how different people navigate them. Daniel's a really interesting narrator and a great narrator for this story because he sees things in some ways so directly. In other ways, he misses some of the nuance and is confused by things that might not be confusing to everybody. And so we're getting the story through his eyes and you really start to see how complex this whole world of high school dating and romance and love can be. He just is missing that Mona and Gabe aren't interested in each other because they're both so interested in him. He feels like they're both always with him because they want to be together. It's a little bit easy to get frustrated with Daniel just because he keeps trying to control these people. And he's really doing it with the best intentions. He has a very big heart. He he really wants the best things for his friends. So while you're frustrated, you also understand that it's that impulse that is causing him to do this. Daniel was harmed in a past relationship. It was a friendship. And he told that friend, he was very close to this friend, and he told that friend that he was autistic. And it didn't seem to change the friendship, and they were still very close. But behind his back, that friend went and then made fun of him and sort of really belittled him. This ended up obviously being devastating and very hurtful. Daniel's thought process after that is that that is what is always going to happen. If any friend or anybody that he's interested in beyond friendship or even a teacher or anybody finds out that he is autistic, they will instantly change the way that they view him and change how much they care about him and change how they interact with him. That he had this one experience like that in his mind, that's the only way that it can go. He's really going to have to see and learn otherwise and really trust the people around him to be able to understand that that's not going to be the case. Daniel also starts to learn that if he doesn't share this piece of him with people that he really cares about, they're going to be missing a part of who he is. It's not that he doesn't want to be this way. He wants to fit in and he can't figure out a way to do that without masking his autism. His relationship with Gabe is part of what helps him to realize that he has to start being honest about who he is and testing those waters and seeing if people will care about him. Gabe is very relaxed and forgiving, but Gabe is also dealing with their own stuff. Gabe is misgendered sometimes by teachers, but sometimes in very public ways. And I think this speaks pretty strongly to a systemic problem with gender biases and with people's inability to see outside binaries. The systems that are set up are not naturally inclusive. And you start to see how gender specifically is such a part of daily life and language and terms, things like prom king and prom queen. As our main character, Daniel, is constantly examining neurodivergence and sexuality and even self-identity. And because he is the one telling us the story and he is also someone holding a camera, we are given this glimpse into what he's seeing through that lens. He says that the filter of a lens between himself and the rest of the world is comforting. But as someone who's telling us the story, he's also giving us what he is capturing in that lens. We really get a very well-rounded view of the situation surrounding Daniel. Uh, Another aspect of this book is the LARPing that Daniel is involved in. The parts of the book when this is happening are given to us in such detail and it provides another view of Daniel. He comes into his own in a different way when he's in these situations. When he's in a character, he's less withdrawn and he's more confident and we see him thinking strategically and he's really happy to be interacting with people when he's LARPing. Whereas at school, he would rather sort of be 
on the sidelines taking pictures, but not in the middle of things and certainly not at any point the center of any interaction. I really enjoyed getting to know Daniel, everything about him, his sense of humor, his concern for the people that he cares about. He's really a heartwarming character. And this book sort of really delivers that feeling, that heartwarming feeling. The author himself, James Ramos, is autistic and queer and Black like Daniel. So we're really provided with this careful and sensitive and realistic portrayal of a wonderful character. I recommend that you read Daniel Deconstructed by James C. Ramos. Thanks for joining me.